Hello, everyone, inside and outside. Welcome to Art Laboratory Berlin. Welcome to the live performance of the first reading group of the project Unborn Zero Times Nine. And the first reading group is called Ectogenesis. And I have here with me Dear Shuli Chang, the artist of the project Unborn Zero Times Nine that we have just opened up in the exhibition yesterday night in the group exhibition Matter of Flux. We have here also other participants of the reading group here at Art Laboratory Berlin in Berlin, but we also Welcome everyone outside worldwide who is joining us online, participants of the reading group Ectogenesis. As a tiny little introduction, I would like to give the following information. So in context of our new series, Permeable Bodies, Art Laboratory Berlin, we launch a series of online reading groups to basically fork out pro the project Unborn Zero Times Nine. And behind us sitting here, you already see the wall piece, which is part of the project. Initiated by Shuli Chang, together with Evan Chardonnay, with Future Baby Production, the project Unborn Zero Times Nine reflects on the techno-scientific developments in obstetrical medicine, its social, cultural, philosophical, and prospective implications and to offer an artistic view of the science in the making. During 2021 until 2022, Unborn Zero Times Nine was part of the EU platform Art for Med EU, which focuses on a methodological framework that fosters collaboration between artists, health, biomedical researchers, and the online reading group that we are having today, the first live stream, uh, it aims to enable cross-border knowledge exchange across nations, races, gender, real and virtual borders. For the studies in three specific topics, and today is the first part, ectogenesis, and there is also others to come, ultrasound and surrogacy. The online web platform incorporates reading materials, core writing pads, and online chats as multiple interface entries. And dear audience, you will be part of it in the next two, two hours to listen to readings and to the results of the last four weeks when the participants, together with dear reading group leader Chloe Romanis and Shuli Chang, were chatting and meeting and discussing. So welcome to the first um, live stream reading group. And I'm very happy that you're here, Shuli, and Chloe online, and all the reading group participants. Thank you so much for contributing. Hi, thanks everybody, um, everybody to be here. Uh, so uh, this reading group actually is not only just as you see it now, it actually has been going online uh, through a web interface on, on Bone Zero Times Nine website for a month. And so uh, during this month, uh, we have uh, Koi uh, Romanis as the leader of the reading group, particularly on the topics of ectogenesis, which uh, uh, Koi is really uh, one of the, the scholars that have been uh, researched into this area. Uh, so with Koi leading uh, the 12 people reading groups. Uh, it has been uh, on the internet uh, through the writing pad, the reading pad and the chat. Uh, they have been uh, exchanging some idea and have a whole list of materials. Uh, so today um, I'm actually gonna do a screen sharing or introduce uh, this uh, uh, on-site uh, platform. Um, let me see, I share, okay. Are we sharing? Okay. Uh -huh. um, the read is actually will start. Uh, hold on. Okay. I couldn't seem to go back to the other interface, uh, but it's okay. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so the interface actually started with uh, 
kind of bring out all these uh, tech work, the issues, as you see in the gallery installation at our laboratory building, we also have a wall uh, painted with uh, these uh, uh, pure data graphic patch with all these keywords uh, kind of uh, indicating what is an issue here when we start talking about reproduction technology and particularly concerning women, concerning uh, a different group of people. The project initiated with the uh, ultrasound technique, uh, uh, trying to develop a low cost uh, echo stethoscope and uh, hoping to reach out to uh, a different uh, diverse uh, community to discuss these topics. So the first reading group, there are uh, in design have three reading group. One is on um, ectogenesis to be followed by a uh, ultrasound and at the end to be uh, uh, followed by surrogacy. Uh, if you go on to this website, unborn zero times nine, dot labomedia.o.web platform, which you should have seen it on the website from the gallery. Uh, so the website is really designed as such. So each reading group, we now in the first month of the uh, ectogenesis uh, reading group. So as you open up the, the, this reading group, this interface, you have the intro about what is uh, this particular topic. You have also the intro about the issues that are concerning um, ectogenesis, what is the issue here? Uh, as here it says that uh, this particular reading group will uh, start a month ago and, uh, you know, cultivated in this uh, online and on-site uh, hybrid performance. Uh, so on the website, you can actually read everything here. We also have the leader uh, information of the leader being um, uh, Elizabeth Coromanis and uh, uh, she has a quite a impressive uh, uh, bio or, or uh, vitae. Uh, at the moment, I think she is actually located at uh, Harvard University. So coming from um, from New, uh, from Boston uh, in USA. Uh, however, when we started open, uh, open call for reading group, we got really uh, impressive people applying. And at the end, we have 12 people. And so as you can see, we also here on the website, we also showing all the 12 readers um, that including their bio, their interesting, you know, so this is the website you can really explore. Uh, of course, during uh, this whole one month, first, uh, we have to say we list all the reading material. So uh, the readers and the leaders, they can go in and uh, put on all the reading material. So for example, here, uh, you can see through the, through the months, you can see uh, many different books, <laughs> uh, different references, and also uh, many different articles. And so these are, will become such an archive for us to use ever we want to come back to these particular issues. You know, of course, every uh, listed uh, is a link. Uh, we can also come back to um, the writing. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, um, oh, the writing. So on the writing, we also have the another path and so everybody can sort of write down here. Here's uh, uh, indicated by different colors of uh, people's uh, idea, the discussion. And so this is like all like inputting throughout these uh, one month, yeah? Uh, at the same time, we also have a chat interface. Oh my God, where am I? It's supposed to be confusing interface, so don't get uh, worried about this. Uh, we also have a chat interface uh, somehow. And uh, the main thing about the chat interface is at the end, we actually did save all the chats. So uh, for example, during this month, there's actually quite a few chat happened. And um, um, I think it's in the writing pad. And here we actually organize all the chats uh, archived. So here you can see on uh, May 15, um, the chat happened and uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, sort of time coded as to uh, what everybody was saying. And so really great. 
so this is the you know uh, a very for me uh, by doing an online interface uh, for the reading group. Actually, the idea came from during COVID uh, when I start doing the programming of these uh, interface with uh, two programmer from Labo Media in Orleans in France, who I have collaborated for some time on this project. So the idea for this interface is really during the COVID time and it becomes such an issue of um, holding, sort of wanting to hold a reading group but the sort of face-to-face -face reading group become impossible. And the way we thought about it, you know, is to do this online one. And also uh, for me, the reading group also always takes some time. You know, you simply cannot uh, just thinking that, uh, uh, we just come together and, uh, you know, one time, two times. So having a one month duration at each, at each person's uh, kind of uh, allocated time, you can do the input at the same time. You can also, um, uh, you can do the input and you can do the, um, you can do the input and you can also uh, hold check sections online. And so I, I find, of course, uh, I really thank you for all these uh, readers and Corey to participate in this first time, uh, the first uh, launch of this interface, because since uh, the programmation was done in 2001, but we never got a chance to realize this reading group. And so also thank you very much for the Art Laboratory Berlin and the uh, particular premium of bodies uh, again we got to allow us to actually finally in 2003 uh, we can launch this interface so uh, this is my kind of brief introduction and uh, I'm uh, gonna stop sharing and uh, I'm also gonna just introduce uh, who we have here so we have uh, Elizabeth Colonomanis as leader on site uh, online and on site in the Art Laboratory Berlin uh, um, gallery uh, for this installation, we also have Kalonina Zininuit and uh, Amber and Amber Ella. And uh, online we have Ilka, we have Alison Sperling, Harold Holly Isart, and Christine Millet. Uh, so we're gonna. Uh, follow this order, and I will hand the microphone, as we say, uh, to Koi for the introduction, and followed by the readers, and uh, hopefully, uh, not hopefully, and we will get into the discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, and, and thank you so much for inviting me to, to take part in this reading group. It's been really an amazing experience. Um, I thought I would just start by um, giving a little bit of a summary of the sort of questions that I think are open and that are important to be discussed, you know, across uh, different disciplines, like in the in the public sphere and so on. Uh, and that's sort of how this reading group was was structured in terms of the reading. Um, just the first thing to say, and I think it's really interesting and important to acknowledge that 2023 is a really important year for a discussion of exogenesis not least because it marks 100 years of the existence of the word. So exogenesis was a concept first um, presented to, um, was a, a lecture in Cambridge called Daedalus by J.B.S. Haldane, who was a British geneticist. And he talked about this idea of exogenesis in the future. And he did describe it as something that he thought was effectively inev inevitable, something that was probable in the future, um, reflecting on the present state of biological science. And this is the same person who, um, you know, theorised first about IVF and so on as well. And that being 100 years ago, I think makes for an interesting point of reflection about where we are um, in the 100 years since the idea was first suggested. In his lecture, he included this little uh, sort of satirical um, reference from what he calls a stupid undergraduate student. Um, and that essay makes reference to um, France being the first to introduce exogenesis uh, to the population in 1968. Um, and also he makes reference to uh, well, this satirical essay, um, by 2034, only 30% or less than 30% of births would be of woman born because people would be opting for this mechanical alternative uh, to a pregnancy. Um, we know those things didn't happen. Um, 
France does not have some of the most liberal regulation of, of reproductive technology in Europe, but also um, the idea of a pregnancy entirely separate from um, a person of female physiology is still very hard to imagine in the current state of affairs. So we're a very long way off from this vision that Haldane had 100 years ago. But I still think that there's some merit in the imaginary he introduced, right? And there are still progress, there is progress being made towards this idea of gestation outside the body. While we're closer than ever to the prospect of ecto gestation, gestation outside the body, that's very much in the partial sense. So like an alternative to neonatal intensive care. Um, there are several teams who have announced an intention to move towards clinical trials of ectogestation in the very near future, but these are all models based on sort of taking over a gestation outside the body as opposed to growing babies from scratch. And their focus and, and, and trying to make gestation possible outside the body is really positioned as a solution to prematurity um, as opposed to treating pregnancy itself or how we reproduce as a problem. And I do think that that frames some of how we ought to think about the technology. Um, as, a, as, a, as an aside, while um, uh, gestation outside the body is also technically very difficult from a scientific perspective, in its totality, I mean, law in most countries um, prohibits experimentation on human embryos past 14 days, which makes the idea of complete ectogestation um, a, a, uh, uh, further away than we think, not just because the science needs to advance to that point, but because there are like cultural, political, um, legal barriers um, to get there. So I think the real question we ought to be asking is, will we get to complete ectogestation in the next hundred years? You know, when people are having this conversation again, um, uh, 20, well, two, one, two, three. Um, my maths is not the best. <laughs> so maybe we'll still be having these conversations then. That said, um, I am firmly of the belief that speculating, much in the way that, that Shuli's art does here, is thinking about these futures is incredibly important. And um, it gives us space to think about what kind of reproductive futures we do want. And also to reflect on what we've learned about um, the introduction of other reproductive technologies, to think about this idea of gestation outside the body as like the extreme embodiment of a complete change in how human reproduction takes place. To, to think back on the kinds of changes we've slowly been seeing that also have been huge changes. And the other reading groups I'm sure come to this, you know, ultrasound is a huge change. Surrogacy is a huge change in how we think about reproduction. And exogenesis is, is sort of the next one uh, on that trajectory. So, I think ectogenesis raises worlds of, of possibilities and we can imagine all sorts of different ways in which this technology would be used. But really what I want to just say um, in the last few minutes is that for me, it just raises endless questions. I thought I was going to write a very quick, nice, neat PhD about the regulation of, of reproductive technologies. And in fact, I found myself with more questions than I have answers. And even engaging in this reading group, I still have yet more questions as opposed to any answers. Um, and these are not the only themes, but we sort of approach this reading group in a way that was quite thematic. And so the questions I'm just gonna raise um, relate to some of those themes. So the first one is, is about understanding what gestation outside the body really even is um, and, and what it means. Um, and I, this question for me comes down to what entities gestating outside the body even are. Um, and this was a question I very much tried to avoid during my PhD, but ended up being the entire thing, because I think it's a very central question in terms of understanding how we approach, um, you know, an entity gestating outside the body. Um, what I mean by this is that some people might argue that that's a fetus, right, because it's still gestating. But that didn't really make sense to me because a fetus is very much a part of a pregnant person's body. Um, it, it also strikes me that it's not a newborn because it's not born, right? Like it doesn't exist in the external environment. It's not interacted with, it doesn't, it's not adapted to the environment that we all live in, um, both physically and socially. Um, and that raises this idea of this entity being something new. Um, 
I this is where I fall, but I think um, this is an entity we've never seen before. Um, you know, this isn't a, a gestation outside the body's never happened. And um, once that's possible, I think we need to ask ourselves what that entity is and what what we owe it um, and, and how we ought to treat it and so on. And I think that raises some interesting questions. So that's just understanding. The next question I think relates to what does gestation outside the body mean for people who can become pregnant? So there is a long standing debate amongst different people about whether this is a step in the right direction for gender equality. So some people argue that this is fabulous because it means uh, liberation from a natural injustice. I know Alison had strong feelings about that. Um, like, you know, it's just unfair, so to speak, that only certain types of people have the capacity to gestate, um, predominantly women, um, but people of female physiology. And this technology would mean that that burden in reproducing those physical risks wouldn't fall um, only to those people. And so some liberal feminists in particular argue that this technology is great because it means no more pregnancy um, and people, or, or at least no more unconsensual pregnancy. Um, on the flip side, there are some people, and I, and I think I fall more into this camp, who are sympathetic to the fact that pregnancy should be a choice, obviously, but think that this framing of the debate maybe isn't useful. Um, and maybe we risk pathologizing pregnancy too much if we talk about needing a solution to a natural pregnancy. You know, we need to mechanically replace something that biologically some people are capable of doing. Um, and there are some concerns about how it would impact on particular people. So would there be certain types of people who would be prevented from gestating, so to speak, because we would consider them? Um, Julia Cavallari uses this term as substandard gestator. Um, you know, people who already are subject to so much criminalization and vill villainization um, across the world for things that happen during their pregnancy. And I, and I say this at the moment being in the United States where people... And, and pr predominantly people um, disproportionately who are black and brown are subject to so much um, uh, regulation about their choices uh, during pregnancy, including um, criminal um, investigation. And I think there are some questions then about whether ectogestation leads to that only being exemplified because we now have this idea of an alternative. So, you know, if someone's gestation isn't good enough or we don't think someone should be a gestator. They don't have to be because we have machines. And so those two ideas are sort of in conflict. Um, the other question that I think raises um, some uh, well, raises some issues about perverse and abusive uses of this technology. But ectogestation has become somewhat of an imaginary for the anti-abortion campaign or, uh, in different spaces. So it's become a way of talking about how can we end abortion, so to speak. And so there are lots of people who defend the use of ectogenesis or ectogestation in place of allowing people to have a conventional abortion. Um, so again, I think this is a way of imagining the technology as actually something that comes to restrict people's individual rights surrounding pregnancy, as opposed to thinking about the benefits. And so I think whilst I don't always like engaging in the debate about abortion on the terms that they are sometimes presented as anti-choice, I think it is still important that we think through um, the way in which ectogestation might feed into the public imaginary and affect the way, you know, we talk about fetuses and we talk about gestation and how that might come to impact on sort of the general public's perception of abortion and pregnant people's rights. Um, in a more important, I think, broad sense of, of what this technology has the potential to do, um, it is a procreative technology and it might be able to do a lot of good for people who are unable to gestate themselves, um, who at the moment, you know, have the option of surrogacy potentially, but otherwise maybe being childless. I think it's important to think about access questions, um, and we didn't get into this so much, but I think maybe this is just a thing for discussion, is how we ensure that access is um, available to everybody who might need or want it. Um, ectogestation in particular to me really speaks to the needs of particular groups. So I, I'm, I'm like same-sex male couples, for example, ectogestation entirely outside the body might be, um, well, fabulous because it would allow them to, to reproduce. Um, but then 
we've seen uh, throughout history that new reproductive technologies tend to be least accessible um, to LGBTQ groups. Um, and so we need to start thinking about how we um, ensure that these technologies access the right people. So, as I said, more questions than answers, but those are sort of the broad themes um, that we talked about in this group. And I am really excited that everybody is here to sort of give their two cents on something. <laughs> Hello, is it my turn now? Yeah, okay. Well, first I would like to, of course, thank you for organizing this um, to the German Art Lab, Julio and Chloe for incredibly uh, wonderful and very stimulating articles. I really, really enjoyed reading and thinking about ectogenesis. I mean, I've been thinking about reproduction technologies since I started my academic career, but this is a different level of thinking about the power relationships, because um, in my research, it was always pregnancy was could be it could be empowering at the same time, it can be quite disempowering. Um, so I was thinking a lot about the power while uh, reading and um, reading the writing pad and the articles. So. We decided, we agreed on, we would read the pieces from the pad, so I'm going to return to that. But um, the theme is about the power and control of the uh, reproductive body. So I find the idea of liberation very interesting as it links to my research on maternal effects of epigenetics. I didn't write about this on the writing pad, but maternal ep um, effect of epigenetics looked at how, looks at how the mechanisms outside our genes switch on and off certain genes and how it can affect the child, the baby, and the future uh, health of that child. For example, it's said that stress, diet, and exercise of the pregnant woman is very important, and it can uh, avoid or cause chronic disease in the later stages of life and even might pass on to the next generations. So that is the area that I was interested in. Um, and because of this reason, we, we see that epigenetics is being integrated into a range of risk reduction protocols in reproductive healthcare to control pre-pregnancy weight and preventing obesity to protect the lifelong health of the offspring. Although other interpretations of this research suggest that the risk is contingent and unpredictable, and it's, most of the studies are done on animals than humans. Um, medical anthropologist Natalie Valdez found that there are more behavioral clinical trials that analyze the effectiveness of nutritional interventions of diet and exercise on pregnant women than ever before. So as you can see, there is a huge focus on how to control the productive body to shape the next generations. Um, there are claims uh, and this was on Emil College London's website on epigenetics. They removed it and it's on YouTube now. That stress during, uh, stress during pregnancy uh, can affect the child's mental health. For example, it can make your child criminal, apparently. Uh, therefore, you should be controlling the stress during your pregnancy. So as you can see, scientists treat the womb as an isolated environment that can be controlled to create the best baby possible. So this idea, I think, is not very far from the ectogenesis. In that aspect, there's already techno-scientific imaginaries and justification to use ectogenesis to engineer the development of the fetus, rather than leaving this to pregnant people who are just human and therefore fallible. So I'm not sure whether this is empowering or not. So this takes me to think about the control idea in um, attached to Foucault's biopower. In the history of sexuality, Michel Foucault describes biopower as a positive influence on life that endeavors to administer, optimize, and multiply it, subjecting it to precise controls and comprehensive regulations. So that makes me think whether we can see ectogenesis as a tool for biopower. Foucault describes biopower as a regulatory power that focuses on the control of the species body and its reproduction with the aim of producing a healthy population. So in that way, actually, it, it really works, isn't it? Uh, keeping the 
baby in an isolated environment and making sure that everything is okay in that space. Um, according to Foucault, the precise control of bodies and populations in a modern phenomenon that started in the era of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so I suppose, actually, ectogenesis would really fit in that way. It will impose the physical and physiological burdens of egg retrieval if the conception is carried out in a petri dish, if, if the technology is a part of IVF, for example. That might include daily injections, hormonal stimulation, blood tests, screening, and the surgery. So the, the process that women um, or um, people with a, a, reproductive, a female reproductive body still go through, so that's not new. So it is an extreme regulation of the body through the imposition of expert knowledge, as Pollock uh, argued. On the other hand, through ectogenesis, maternal body is no longer treated as an environment that can be monitored and regulated to engineer the perfect body and future generations. The model of biopower is helpful to understand the macro interest in producing a healthier population through interventions in human reproduction, but I'm not sure how ectogenesis fits in this. So again, I have these questions about is it empowering or disempowering? I'm also thinking of the fact that throughout the human history, having a uterus gave women control and power because of their reproductive capacity and gestational influence. They can control the fetus's environment and its development to a certain extent. Not as much as the, I think epigenetic scientists claim to be, but still, you know, that you know, alcohol might affect the baby or uh, eating nice cheese <laughs> can harm the baby. And women have been always aware of this, and society would actually force them to eat and behave in a certain way. But this also gave them a kind of control and privilege. Um, I think Maida was, yeah, Maida was saying that, um, for example, she was giving the example from Islam where women are treated in a different way during pregnancy, and they are um, assumed to be get rid of their sins. I was thinking of um, Judaism, for example, where the um, religion goes through the bloodline from the mother to the baby, so that might be another example of it. So women has a sacred status, special status during pregnancy. So when uterus is replaced by technology, what will happen to those whose power partly, partially relies on it? Um, this may be not an issue for a privileged woman whose power comes from education, social capital, career, etc., um, so ectogenesis can be empowering for her as she is no longer inhibited. Uh, but it might be a big loss of power for another woman who have different kind of backgrounds. So I think it's all a matter of socio-cultural context and social inequality, inequalities. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Hi, I think I'm next, yeah? Cool, hi everyone, um, happy to be here. Uh, it was nearly impossible for me to choose um, one paragraph. The readings um, really completely were transformative um, for me um, and your work, especially Chloe, it was really, really um, excellent to read. So I've selected a passage from Catherine McKay's 2020 article, The Tyranny of Reproduction, Could Ectogenesis Further Women's Liberation? And so I'll read the selected passage, and then I just have a short paragraph of response to that um, that I will read. McKay writes, insofar as adoptive kinship and same-sex parents are already pushing against pronatalist and geneticist assumptions, ectogenesis will further put pressure on this view. Ectogenesis reveals the possibility that what has hitherto been a major component of female reproductive function, gestation, might not involve a woman at all. If an infant might not be carried or birthed by anyone as such, then carrying and birthing are undermined as relevant factors in being a woman or mother. This argument extends what Singer and Wells calls the sexual equality argument. Their proposal following, or sorry, drawing on Firestone was that ectogenesis held the potential to achieve equality between women and men by rethinking the role mother, releasing women from the unequal status of primary bearer of and care for children. I'm going to skip a little bit here. Ectogenesis is one technological possibility. Um, that serves to open the conceptual space for a deeper understanding of parent. This conceptual space can be afforded by other ideas as well, as Sophie Lewis argues regarding full surrogacy, 
but ectogenesis seems to provide a unique opportunity. This is because of the proposition of removing pregnancy from the body entirely. If an infant is not of woman born, but be but decanted from an artificial womb, then the primary caring role cannot be determined de facto by who gave birth to it. So it encourages an understanding of mother and father as social roles, not as gender um, or biologically determined identities. So I was really struck in the readings uh, by the ways in which ectogenesis encourages us to think more about this decoupling of the category of woman from biology. And as the passage I read for this deeper understanding of the parent as a concept or role. Um, as we know from this reading and others, as has been a crucial project of feminist theory and feminist science studies for decades. Ectogenesis as a still partially science fictional process, um, which interests me personally, and technology reveals at least more fully to me. Um, and again, following much work in feminist theory and black feminism and feminist and queer science fictions amongst many other places, um, continues to push on the ways that we have to uh, continue this work of rethinking care and kinship, um, of expanding notions of the familial beyond blood ties, of decentralizing the labor of gestation and reproduction from women, et cetera, right? And the list goes on and on. Um, so that we have to ask, um, perhaps, again, how and if the claim that anyone can mother uh, is liberated further by the claim that regardless of gender or biology, the concept of parent should be the same for anyone who takes on this role. So mothering, and I'm thinking of, um, you know, and I know Art Lab has done stuff on this before, mothering and slash othering to follow Alexis Pauling Gums has been this important category uh, in this regard already. But what happens to the concept of mothering when ectogenesis becomes a widely accessible, and I think it depends um, on this accessibility, accessible possibility, um, what use anymore are these concepts of fathers and or versus mothers or other caretakers? Thanks. I think it's me next. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Shuli, for organizing this and for everyone at, um, in Berlin and to the other readers. I've really enjoyed it and chatting to people online um, and going through the readings. Uh, similarly, I think I haven't, I think more questions have arisen than answers for me. Um, yeah, but that's good uh, because, yeah, I think, I think. I think part of the reason that I'm interested in it is is as a speculative thing and as a provocation, and I feel like um, that's a useful yeah it's a, it's a, it's a useful activity and process. And um, but I think this has helped me ground it in what's actually happening materially right now with partial ectogenesis. So thank you, Chloe, for that because that's I think been something that maybe I've sidestepped getting excited about what's what's going to happen in a hundred years or whatever. Um, so that's been good. So I'm going to read a short paragraph from Julia Cavalier's piece from 2020, Gestation, Equality and Freedom, Ectogenesis as a Political Perspective, which was under the sort of liberation from pregnancy gender equality theme on the pad. Um, OK, so it's on page 79 in case anyone wants to read along. So while ectogenesis seems to be able to promote equality in biological reproduction, it is unclear whether severing the tie between biological reproduction and women would be sufficient to obtain equality in social reproduction. It seems that more than ectogenesis would be necessary to achieve this kind of equality. While it is possible that women's biology and their unique role in begetting children is at the root of their primary role in child rearing, this role has been socialized and has become predominant in many societies. Granted, values and norms surrounding child rearing can change, and the introduction of ectogenesis could shape such, such values and norms. However, one issue must be noted. Other assisted reproductive technologies have created new family structures and new ways of interpreting social and biological ties, but have also reinforced dominant and widespread beliefs on the importance of the genetic tie and failed to challenge the existing order. They are, and this is a quote from Sarah Franklin, in no way aim to challenge the nuclear family to enable women to be less defined by their reproductive capacity, to develop more feminist definitions of biology, or to dissolve the patriarchal structures of society. This is relevant to the present discussion as only introducing a new reproductive technology or practice, even one that so radically changes biological reproduction, does not determine how and whether such a technology or practice will go about shaping current arrangements and social values and norms. 
The way technologies go about shaping extant arrangements and norms seems to depend more on how these technologies are designed, implemented and regulated and to serve whose interests than on the technologies themselves. And then a few um, lines later, as it, current, as it is currently defended, ectogenesis is a red herring. It distracts from the most urgent and pressing needs of certain women and it locates the problem in women's biological capacities rather than in current societal structures and arrangements. And there she is talking about full ectogenesis, I think not partial ectogenesis. Um, yeah, I just, I feel like that sums up quite a lot of the stuff that I came away from the reading group with. Um, that basically it's it's current societal structures and arrangements rather than the technology itself um, that's sort of crucial to the answers that we've been asking to, to the questions that we've been asking. And this idea of stratified reproduction that was in the reviewing the womb article that we looked at, um, I also feel like is important there. And I wrote something in the pad about the difference between choice um, and reprodu reproductive choice and reproductive justice. And I think that that's an important sort of framing when we're discussing this technology and all reproductive te technologies. Um, but one thing I'm still struggling with is, is, and this doesn't just apply to ectogenesis, it applies to sort of reproductive technologies in general, but is the desire for genetic ties. And um, is that something as feminists we should be problematizing and pushing back against, or is it something we should be sympathetic to? Um, it's something that I, I, I feel like I'm trying to problematize in my work, but I haven't experienced infertility, I don't have children, and um, it's something that I often get checked on. Uh, and I feel like ectogenesis sort of adds to that whirlwind in my head. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Hello, I think I'm next. Um, I'd like to thank Chloe for leading the group and also um, Julie and Art Laboratory Berlin. Um, it's been a great opportunity to participate and the readings have been really uh, informative. I'm coming um, to the group as an artist. And so um, I feel very intimidated uh, by the scholars that are in this group. Um, and so I just have um, a few brief things that I thought about in relationship to some of the readings, and um, particularly Chloe's article on reviewing the womb. Um, so I was thinking a lot about um, the notion of the maternal fetal conflict and that kind of ongoing um, perception that the mother and fetus are in battle during pregnancy, and also kind of that incompatibility between the pregnant woman and the fetus. And so I thought that that really suggested um, more of a violent rather than a symbiotic relationship. So rather than nourishing and nurturing, it's implied that this interaction is almost combative almost like a war between the two, which I found very problematic. Um, and then also in reading about this boundary or barrier of a pregnant woman and the need to secure consent for ectogenesis, it made me immediately think about borders and also um, like borders between territories and countries. So um, I found that to be uh, suggesting that the male desire to replace the womb and develop ectogenic, ectogenic technology is fundamentally about conquest and perhaps fetuses could be seen as the spoils of war. Um, so I, I I can say that ectogenesis is one of these topics which I like the most. Uh, so it's like very um, technologically and biologically challenging and at the same time somehow socially controversial. I would even say that it's uh, very controversial. Um, so um, uh, I, I can say also that um, while reading uh, the text, I discover that uh, many things are overlapping in, in, in these uh, readings and it, it made me thinking that uh, maybe those are the points which are the most crucial. What I would like to um, do right now is uh, firstly reading a fragment which I found um, important um, for considering uh, the importance of the language, how we communicate um, these new technologies. And also what I uh, found intriguing is how media, like popular media uh, inform us about these developments and how 
a scientific paper um, named this uh, phenomena. So uh, I will start with reading the paper, which is titled Neonatal Incubator or Artificial Womb, Distinguishing uh, Ictogestation and uh, Ictogenesis Using the me Metaphysics of Pregnancy. Uh, the um, text is written by Kinma and Finn. And this is actually the introduction, but this is full of notions which I found uh, very um, intriguing. Mm, let me just move to the point. In 2017, Nature reported a successful extra uterine support system for extremely premature lamps. This was variously reported as a uterus like plastic sac, a unique womb like device, and more often uh, an artificial womb. It sparked widespread media speculation about the imminent arrival of human ectogenesis. Um, to, the exp uh, to the express frustration uh, of the uh, authors of the study, who are notably careful to avoid and such, uh, uh, any such terminology in their article. They state their goal is not to extend the current limits of viability, but strictly to improve the outcomes for those infants who are already cared for in neonatal intensive care units. Yet the media reactions is hardly surprising. The idea of artificial gestation uh, of growing um, gestation of growing babies in, uh, in bottles has a um, broad and prominent place in our cultural history. And then I will move to my notes, which I actually uh, put in the pad. Um, because uh, it was a result of reading uh, more than only this text. So I also noted that um, in the papers, uh, they, they are very interesting form formulations like pregnancy as a barbaric act, um, which I think is evoking an emotional reaction immediately. And ICTO children, for instance, which can sound a little bit like I don't know, maybe out of nature and very technologically. Tentative pregnancy um, or a tyranny of reproduction. And the, the most intriguing for me was the, the, the notion of biobags, which was like very like commodity-like from my perspective. Uh, and also I found very interesting the notion of gestating, which is like putting together the meaning of that notion and also is somehow very metaphorical because the term is telling story at the same time. And uh, I also discovered that uh, what is uh, happening in terms of development of this technology is something uh, reminding me a lot, uh, the idea of becoming liminal proposed by uh, Susan Mary Squire. So we are in transition, we are uh, trying to find new methods uh, for, um, I mean, many, layers of our uh, embodiment. So this is one of them. And uh, then I also uh, pointed that um, the discourse about these technologies and their development is different in different areas of the world and different countries and different cultural contexts. So we need to also consider how this discourse is shaped in different areas. And if it comes about uh, the possibility of liberation, uh, because we uh, have also these terms of uh, pregnancy as, as, as a barbaric act, so ectogenesis possibly would be the liberation from this barbaric act. I think it's also um, necessary to think not only about bioethical regulation about this uh, method, but also we need to think what is happening afterwards. So what should be changed uh, in society and also the idea of raising kids uh, to make this method uh, accommodated and also um, to, to make these children possibly um, coming from this method uh, developing um, in the society properly. And um, I think also that uh, this topic of ectogenesis is quite similar to the topic of GMO, for instance, in that sense that we are discussing something like nature culture issue. And uh, if people are against these kind of methods, I think this is also 
rooted in this feeling that we need to follow everything what is natural and this kind of solutions which we read about they are maybe uh, something so new that it, it looks like something out of natural order and um, what also struck my attention and it will be the, the very last thing uh, um, besides the language and formulations uh, is also the aesthetics because we are sitting behind an artwork which is somehow representing um, this knowledge and these new possibilities and uh, i think the way how we are imagining these things and also how they are offered at this moment uh, it's also very intriguing and it's not also intriguing because of the discussion about that but i think that this is also uh, very interesting how um, the shape of the um, possible machine uh, or this bio bag will be influencing the development of the fetus inside. So I think more or less those are my observations. And uh, I can say also that the, the discussion which I had um, one day with uh, others um, uh, about these topics, uh, I found it very, very uh, brain feeding and I think it's a great opportunity to discuss this uh, today as well. Um, so yeah, I came into the reading group with absolutely no scholarly background in ectogenesis or science, um, but I thought it was an interesting opportunity to partake in because I'm someone with the possible like the ability I think to to hold a baby inside of me but also identify as someone who's non-binary and it's interesting to be able to read about this topic and also to discuss with people who have more knowledge about it um, because then it informs me of how I would feel about ectogenesis. Um, but it's funny because as I was going through the reading list, like as informative as it was, there was like an element of like objectivity to something that is like extremely subjective. Um, and Vanessa, one of the participants of the reading group uh, provided like two PDFs of like essays that had like, uh, sort of like more of a subjective emotional tone to it. And one of them sort of discussed this other article that was written by a woman whose last name was Smith Windsor, uh, who had a baby um, that was partially gestated outside of her. Um, and the way that she wrote about it was extremely beautiful, um, but I, I did not agree with her conclusion because I feel like her resentment about the experience was actually misdirected because what it seemed what seemed to be the issue for her was the the control that the state would have over her child rather than the actual machine that facilitated like the the, the growth of, of her baby um, so yeah I the extract that I picked was actually from a PDF that Vanessa gave um, and it's by Zoe Sophia, and it's called Container Technologies. Um, the organism cannot be considered apart from the habitat that houses it, and the organism which destroys its environment destroys itself. Meaning circulates through organisms slash environment in the form of transformations, translations, and transmutations of difference. That is, information, the difference which makes a difference. This, the individual mind, is imminent, but not only in the body. It is imminent also in pathways and messages outside the body. And there is a larger mind of which the individual mind is only a subsystem. In this perspective, best summarized in Bateson's lecture, form, substance, and difference, intelligence is not confined to the deliberations of the intending ego or cogito, but can be found in the changing patterns of mutual adaptation and co-adaptation undergone within and by the organism, environment ensemble. The environment itself is a bearer of intelligence. Um, and then I guess I wrote a paragraph that was sort of in a similar emotional vein, because again, yes, I don't really have that much of a like scholarly background. Um, it hasn't been easy to articulate how I feel about ectogenesis. Uh, over the past few weeks, I've let the word echo in my mind. 
Sometimes I've said it out loud to myself to see if there would be some form of instinctual response, but so far nothing, or maybe not nothing, rather shimmers of curiosity and maybe a little excitement. Uh, knowledge in its purest form is harmless. Understanding the functionality and processes of things, organic, inorganic, and anything in between is or should be seen as a gift because to understand slash to know is an opportunity to empathize and contextualize ourselves in the world around us. Humans, after all, are not the center of the universe. It's kind of amazing that we have or are well on the way to having technology to assist us in growing human life, ex situ. What is not so amazing is the potential for it to be weaponized. This is where a gut feeling kicks in. The possibility for it to be utilized to reinforce societal oppression is daunting. Power over care seems to be the issue. There seems to be room only for one specific narrative of human experience, which is absurd given the diversity of us as a species. The container in which we are trying to bring out to Genesis to full term is undeniably flawed. But talking about it helps and learning about it does too. And hopefully the, the discourse will metabolize into action and reset, or at the very least instigate ameliorations to existing structures and ways of thinking. We should just go back to Chloe. Chloe, would you uh, moderate the discussion? Yeah. Um, so I think um, just to say, I think it's really lovely that in lots of ways where we just left with Amber brings us almost straight back to where um, Ilka ba began with these questions of, of power. Um, I guess the first question I want to ask to all of you, because it's it seemingly in all of these questions, um, reflections in some way, um, even when we were all focusing on different things, whether that was parenthood or language or subjectivity um, or whatever, underlying lots of the conversation we've been having is like I don't know, conceptions of, of gender and sex and, and, and um, you know, the, the, the liberational potential in this technology um, associated with that or um, you know, how technology can sometimes serve to reinforce conventional um, boundaries or understandings of human experience. So I thought I'd throw it out there, like what people's feelings were about that. Like, I do think it's it's interesting that in some ways, all of these reflections do come back to notions of how we think about um, gender and, and sex. And I wonder whether anyone had anything that they wanted to, to add. Okay, you've unmuted. I did. I did. I was trying to construct a sentence in my head. So I'm going to try it with you all then. One of the issues that bother me about human reproduction technologies, if we count this as a human reproduction technology, is that the genetic linkage that we seek. And was it Alison? Somebody actually mentioned this earlier. Um, the kinship. Um, and the genetic uh, connectedness and how important it is to us. So everybody wants to have their genetic baby. And the technologies we are developing, including germ managing techniques, also six for that. Um, so, so that people who tried it five, six times couldn't have a healthy baby can now use this technology in the future as we did in the mitochondrial replacement techniques so that they can have a baby without a certain disease. And we are very happy to actually risk the next generations or whatever, or um, even enforcing the um, a discrimination uh, on people who have disabilities. And we are happy to risk that all, almost. I'm, I'm not, but <laughs> technically there's this move towards let's create the best baby possible and make it sure that we are genetically linked to that baby. And I think that's one of the things that unsettles me with the human reproduction technologies. At the same time, I, I can see totally how it would be liberating for example, for people who couldn't have babies otherwise, like you said, Chloe, like same-sex couples, for example, two, uh, two men together who wanted to have a baby. So it is going to open the doors. But um, I think there's, there's a good reason to think about kinship, how important it is, and also trying to create the baby, the most beautiful, perfect, healthy baby, the ideas behind that. 
Yeah, that wasn't a comment. Uh, was it a comment? Was it a question? I'm not sure, but it's just, you know, something that I think about quite often. I don't know. I mean, maybe Holly and Alison, you had similar thoughts. I wonder whether there was anything you wanted to add in relation to what Ilka just raised. Like, did you see the genetic relatedness that you mentioned as being yeah, part of this, like making perfect babies in the perfect way and the perfect environment type thing? And was your worry about ecto gestation that like it just facilitates our need for genetic relatedness or concern might be the wrong word because I'm sorry just also to say like um I mean I, I will share this with you all but like um I really appreciated Amber's point about um subjectivity and I do have some empirical work that's about to come out where I spoke to people about what they thought this technology would be great for and they were reproductive rights advocates and some of them mentioned uses of this technology for people who don't have you know I mean I, as I say I'm unaware about whether I'm fertile I assume I probably am but if if you live in a world where you know you can't just say or you don't want to because of how you see your bodily confines the privilege of this uh, uh, that, that I just have versus this technology then facilitating that for other people I think is amazing so um it, in what Ilka said wasn't all negative was it so anyway um Holly Allison did you have thoughts the mm, the like the like dreamy sort of utopian vision of of ectogenesis is the one in Marge Piercy's Women on the Edge of Time right this like brooder um where the community well although actually there isn't choice in that everybody has to gestate the, the babies in a brooder and and actually I think more recently or maybe it was in it was an inter, in an interview maybe I don't know five or ten years ago Marge Piercy did say that if she was rewriting the book she would make it a choice that some people could gestate and some people could use the brooder if they wanted to um but in in the crucial to the brooder this this massive artificial womb that sort of looked over by caretakers is that um the nuclear family has been abolished like class race gender divisions don't exist anymore gender has been abolished um and I, I feel like, yeah, the desire for genetic relatedness no longer exists. It's a, it's like an, a utopia way in the future. Uh, I don't know that that's that's like that's the way in which I imagine ectogenesis could exist um, unproblematically. But I feel like right now, like the section that I read and the sort of Sarah Frank, I guess like it's it's yeah, it it just reproduces. The desires and the systems that, that are already present I think if we look at other reproductive technologies and I don't really see how ectogenesis is going to be different from I IVF and surrogacy um, and, ed and egg freezing and who has access to those technologies and what they repro reproduce ultimately um, yeah <laughs> no that's a really good point um Alison yeah, no, I don't have so much to add except just to to echo what what Holly had said earlier. Because when I in my comments, I wasn't thinking so much about genetics or genetic relatedness. Um, you know, I was thinking about um, you know ways that cultural formations of mothering and motherhood um, have already attempted to. I guess it is related, of course, right? Like to to kind of push against the idea that one has to have a kind of genetic relation to mother or to parent, of course. Um, we know that, I mean, I, I assume probably in this group, at least we know that not to be the case or hope that's not the case um, more widely. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, since Holly's comments, I'm thinking a lot about about this, right? It's actually, it's really, really tricky to, to take a position to say, what's, what is the feminist position or is there one, like, does feminism have a place here to intervene in terms of, um, you know, no, we should not, you know, we should not desire genetic relatedness. Well, that seems really dangerous to, to say, um, but so does the, uh, so does the other way around, right? And I don't know if it's just, I mean, I think it is more than just about, right? Genetic relatedness opens up a whole nother question. Like what do people want that for? Yes, it is about mothering and the role between the mother or the parent and the, and the child, but it's also much, it's a, it's a, such a much bigger issue, right? Um, and so to, you'd have to think more about like, okay, what are the reasons, all of the reasons that that, that, that is desired um or whatever so um yeah just thinking about that 
Yeah, I think I, I, I agree with all of what's said. I mean, obviously, in Holly, what you were saying about looking at current technologies and how they use can tell us quite a lot about how this might come to fruition and stuff. But I think as well, in what you were saying, Alison, like the echoes of eugenics in these conversations are quite hard to ignore. But there's also, again, the subjectivity's point about like not telling people how to feel like and even sometimes when people have preferences that result from I mean um Carolina had lots of thoughts about the natural and the cultural and like how we're encouraged to think about reproducing but even when some of that comes from social circumstances where you know we've been taught to think in ways that maybe aren't that liberating sometimes I, I still find it really difficult to tell people that they shouldn't feel a certain way even if it emerges from that from that context um I'm conscious I haven't asked you guys who are in person in Berlin um, anything for a while. So I thought maybe we could have a look at this um, because the natural, um, the point about nature and whether it was value neutral um, and technology and, and whether that's value neutral came up in quite a lot of our chats, didn't it? And um, Carolina, I think you first raised it. I wondered whether you wanted to say a bit more about, um, yeah, that, that concept yeah i think what is um crucial here is also what amber said um uh, that, that this is um related to emotions somehow i mean we are yeah i, I agree that we, when we are reading these papers this is like very professional approach to something which is like phenomenon and we are like stepping outside and Actually, I, I, I'm not sure, but I, I think nobody from the writers experienced um, having baby in this way. So um, this is, uh, and this notion of nature is somehow usually related to emotions, right? So, uh, and also is uh, religion coming, but I don't want to uh, involve uh, this in, in, in what I am going to say. So, um, and it's uh, quite meaningful that, as I said before, it's not only about ectogenesis, it's about everything what is related to changes in our bodies and um, changes in our methods of reproduction. And what is quite crucial here is the, um, I would say uh, the, the notion of out, outside inside because um, ectogenesis is offering uh, gestation totally outside human body that's why it can be very hard for us to even consider it as a i don't know uh, some natural extension this is totally um giving the process to technology um, and it's also the matter of education we need that that's why i was stressing so much the language because um for people writing this kind of papers uh, working at a, academically this is the language which is quite uh, common and uh, the discourse can happen very easily. But we need to remember that they are people um, like outside academia and um, sooner or later the, they will face um, mm -hmm. that this method is appearing and uh, they will also stay maybe in front of the decision if the, mm -hmm. this is something for them or not. Uh, and another thing what is also related to emotion, I would say, is this exaggeration, because I believe this is not obligatory, that if the method will be applied, everyone will, will have only this method. It will be still possibility that we have uh, the natural pregnancy and for people um, having some troubles and not being able to hold the baby. And it's also the question when and who will be allowed if it's like enough to say, I am scared to care, to, to care a baby. I am scared. For instance, this is my personal experience. This is my biggest scare that uh, my body will be deformed and it will be different. So mm -hmm. should I go to the doctor and say, uh, okay, I have these reasons. Can I use this method? Or it's like, I don't know, only because of, um, I, I don't know, like a medical uh, prescription, um, mm -hmm. how it should be um, supported by argumentation. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, I was like moving around the topic of nature, but I think all these things are somehow mm -hmm. uh, related. And uh, this is also quite important to, um, 
to educate people. I mean, mm -hmm. in, not only being incorporated in academia, how it works, and uh, it shouldn't be this controversial way of addressing things that this is, uh, as I mentioned in from this um, nature outcome, um, uh, when media, media started to build this narration, uh, scaring regular society. So um, yeah, I think it's uh, everything more or less which is related to development of new technologies around our bodies will be uh, based on this discussion, which what is natural, what is not natural, what is actually nature in general, and what is technology in frame of the nature. Okay. There's yeah. so much in there, um, but um, I, I like, I'm going to pass to Ilko in a moment. So what I'm going to pull out is, um, I think this point about language that you also raised in your first reflection is really important. And like, does the academic conversation reflect neatly onto people's everyday lives? And I think the answer is clearly no. And some, some of the examples you mentioned, you know, like describing pregnancy as barbaric is, so, I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure lots of pregnant people would, would say that they had that experience, but lots of other people see it as this really fulfilling, meaningful thing that they did. And we obviously had um, religious perspectives on the pad and Ilka mentioned them too. So that's how I'm linking it back to you. I want to throw it to you, Ilka, <laughs> um, with your hand up. <laughs> okay. Um, I was thinking of when we, when we mentioned uh, what, what, what do real people think about these matters? Uh, that took me to my... Um, PhD work where I spoke to women who used donated uh, embryos and eggs to have babies. And what they would say was that they would see this as their biological claim to parenthood, motherhood. So even the genetic material is donated, if it's an embryo or if it's just an, an egg, um, they would they would feel that this, this is how I shape the baby. This is natural because the baby is sharing my blood, it's in my body, it's breathing with me, so that's my baby. Um, so this is going to be a discurs discursive challenge to a natural parenthood or what we see as nature. Um, and I'm also thinking about natural birth uh, advice you would receive. I mean, I, I had a baby and I was told by the midwives and all the medical professionals that I should avoid epidural. If possible, I should give birth naturally. Air, uh, gas and air is fine and all that. Of course, it was brutal. But <laughs> not the pregnancy itself, but childbirth is not something you can just breathe through. In my experience, it wasn't. Um, but there was also this discourse that I see in the... Um, literature I'm visiting in epigenetics that um, actually, for example, C-section is very bad for your baby. And uh, Carolina Institute makes this claim, and I think uh, they are terrifying all the potential um, parents in that way because they say that if the baby doesn't go through the mother's vaginal canal, then it, um, the baby will not be exposed to microbiome, and that will make them prone to disease for the rest of their life. So you ruined your baby because you didn't push. So all this naturalization and romanticization of pregnancy and childbirth is going to be the challenge, I think. It's not just academically, but also um, in lay people terms. Mm -hmm. I think there is something very romantic for some reason <laughs> the, about the labor or carrying the child and you know that being natural and wholesome way of doing it. Those two things together, I think, are really interesting as well, because it's almost like rock and a hard place, isn't it? Like, like if you don't use technology, you're a bad pregnant person because you haven't engaged in X, Y and Z. But on the flip side, you know, if you overuse technology, you know, if you have a C-section where you didn't strictly need one, and I'm saying that like this, um, you know, you're too posh to push and all this terrible stuff. So I, I think it's quite interesting to, I can see situations where that embodies both what you're saying and the other side of the conversation, you know, like if ectogestation existed, would some people who didn't use it be thought of as very selfish because they're, you know, wanting this gestational experience? But on the flip side, would other people who did use ectogestation be thought of as very selfish because they didn't, you know, they didn't do the natural work of, of, of generating? Um, I think it's really interesting. I'm um, glad yeah, can't win. And um, within, um, oh, Holly, before I ask a new question. 
I, I was just going to say that I think it's really important to push back on the idea of pregnancy as something that is like natural or or uh, explicitly connected to women um, and that falling falling into that sort of natural realm downplays reproduction sort of the stratification of reproduction um, and that the technology is useful if it's disrupting the idea of what is a woman and what is biological and what is natural uh, and the fact that 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 one of the technologies is called Eve, I feel like is quite telling in terms of the direction in which it's going. Like it, it's being it, it's being gendered already before it even exists. Um, and like I guess just like pushing back on the idea that women have an, an innate natural connection to the earth or nature, and that we should get power from that. I think we should get power from other things, not biology. Not that that's what was being said at all, but I feel like. Yeah, just the fact that it's being called Eve. Um, mm. And I guess thinking about the way that it's marketed and represented and talked about already to a wide public um, and gendered is really important. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really important point. Um, Amber, I think you have your hand up. Uh, sorry. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just reiterating that language is extremely important, but also that biology, or like more rather, the world around us can be sort of a source of inspiration of expanding how we understand biology, because the way our vocabulary of us, the world around us, is something that we literally made up, and if we actually take a look at in like other species and environments in the world around us and us ourselves, we actually differ in a way that can, it does not exist in a binary way. Mm -hmm. Like we, we've just chosen to create certain limitations and like regulations and restrictions on ourselves. And yeah, and also like the, the, this sort of gladiator style, like, uh, way of speaking about like human beings and technology, you know, like the symbiosis of the two could be, could have like great potential, but for some reason we decide that one has to overcome the other when it could really just be the two working side by side. And also just like, yeah, you know, this idea of like natural and whether or not it's like better than unnatural, it, sort of boils down to empathy and like personal choice, like understanding both sides, even though we personally wouldn't choose one or the other would probably like help in sort of neutralizing this discourse, you know, it's like one isn't better than the other. If you want to take a baby, if you want to go through childbirth instead of like being assisted through c-section or an epidural then that's your choice um and if not then that's also your choice yeah i think that's important and i think um it, it, it as you say empathy but also just about making space and i consider this to be an important you know feminist commitment is making space for perspectives that are contradictory right both can be true um you know um and recognizing that we're all different and we have different feelings about different things for different reasons um yeah um I have some questions about the natural um and I'd be really interested in your feelings about this Kristen as an artist as well and maybe surely you want to <laughs> pitch in because I think this is maybe a design question as well right like do we think that the way that this machine is designed to look might change the way that um people understand and like react to it and and is there a way in this that the design of this machine I see could either could um in some ways embolden you know this is a technological alternative type thinking if it if it looks like you know like Shuli's um design is very um I think it's got the best of both worlds but um there are also questions about whether if we overemphasize the natural in the design, it, it, it might feed into some of those um, 
narratives. I don't know. I've, and just something I've been thinking about recently as we're getting ever closer to partial ecto gestation is, is what, like the design question seems to me to be an ethical and a social question that we should be talking about as much as, um, you know, what does this machine do? And so I'm just really intrigued after all these conversations we've been having for a month, what you all think and what surely what you think about what this should look like. Um, Carolina. Yeah, I, I am not sure this is also a question to surely uh, to what extent this uh, installation in front of us is inspired by what is actually uh, tried in the labs and what is uh, thought about the future of this technology. But um, I know about this phenomenon, which is called the Silicon Valley uh, effect, if I could remember, and it paradoxically, if we are ha having something technological and we are mimicking something very human this is causing something to our brain I mean it's some some trouble this is making some troubles to our brain because we are struggling with this decision is it because it's so close to what we know about our body but at the same time it's external um, so um, there is a research behind saying that if something is technological it's better to and not try to cover this uh, technological aspect. So what I like in this installation um, uh, by Shuli, um, this is uh, actually something in between, I would say, because we have this egg shape and this is uh, the, the, the association is very um, easy that we we have womb and this is also having this this shape please uh, plus this is like the um, uh, meaning of egg in general there is like um, uh, a lot of symbolic in that so, but at the same time it's transparent so we can see everything what is happening inside so um and maybe con some controversy would be in this um seeing what is happening so this mystery of uh, i don't know uh, waiting for for the, the the outcome of pregnancy somehow right so we are uh, only the person being pregnant can feel what is what is going on right and then we have the baby uh, meeting the world so in this case we are like doing vivisection somehow so everyone who is working around because probably it will happen in hospitals or in labs at least in the beginning they can see what is happening so this intimacy of pregnancy is somehow broken so uh, i think it's very uh, intriguing question and uh, as i also um, pointed uh, in my first um, um, uh, talk it was uh, the the issue of um, pragmatic designing so what should be the the point uh, optimization of um, productivity of this machine or it's it should rather like be um, comforting us in terms of using this technology this is mm -hmm. something uh, what shouldn't be in in contrast uh, I think these two things probably should mm -hmm. go together so um, I got very curious and I will be following uh, I mean, what is happening and how these devices are um, designed. Um, I'll pass to Kristen and then surely you might want to add as well. So I'll, Kristen first. I just wanted to um, add how the design of the technology has evolved. So initially it was more of a rigid box for the goats in Japan and they discovered that the the rigid container actually damaged the fetal goat as it was moving around and they suffered brain damage basically um, as a result of it. And so that led to the bio bags that were much more flexible, but the transparency is really um, to privilege um, others like the, the people uh, supervising and administering um, the technology rather than the fetus, right? Because the fetus doesn't want to be in an environment that's light. You know, normally it's very dark, but it's also really loud. And so I think there's a lot in the current design that's more about us uh, being able to watch 
what's happening. And it's all about this kind of mystery of pregnancy. We want to be able to see and observe. It's about the gaze, right? And not really about what's best for the fetus during gestation, right? So I think this idea that we're replicating a womb, we're not, we're not. We're really doing this so that we can watch what's happening. Julie, um, can you unmute? Yeah. Oh, do I have a raise hand? Oh. Um, <laughs> actually, uh, Kristen, thank you for bringing back the, this particular word, like the gaze. And I think uh, in terms, we start talking about this uh, transparency or the gaze, uh, the gaze into the transparency, but then we also have to start uh, as I say, the unborn zero nine times nine actually started with uh, uh, artists in residency in uh, Echo Open, like Echo Pen uh, in Paris. And this is the kind of NGO company who tried to develop the uh, Echo stethoscope uh, for the ultrasound reading. And uh, uh, with this uh, idea of what they can produce a low cost uh, ultrasound machine. And so it can be made more available to developing countries, to the midwife uh, who can actually carry uh, the machine and uh, using mobile phone as an interface for reading. So the project, when it got started, when we got invited to do a residency at this lab, uh, my idea was always to try to, how to render the ultrasound data uh, visible and audible. Uh, by visible, meaning that we could actually read the data. Uh, it's a waveform. Uh, by audible, meaning that how the ultrasound usually in audible that you can actually use the data and for the sound artist uh, to expand uh, over this data and become a sound play. So we actually also did a kind of uh, performance using the uh, echo data from the ultrasound reading. Um, so of course, uh, actually ultrasound happened to be the, I just do a bit of advertisement so that we actually have an open call for ultrasound reading group that just launched uh, two days ago. And we, the next topic for the reading group actually will be a, uh, ultrasound. Of course, back again uh, on the gaze, the ultrasound started with uh, as a, a military intervention as a way to read into uh, the body and particularly when it applied for uh, pregnancy, I think, you know, particularly reading the baby, the woman and the womb. Um, of course, if we talk about the design uh, right from the beginning, the ectogenesis design was always, uh, I think the first one was the, the bio bag, right? Yeah, in Philadelphia, right, in the hospital. So uh, already it was more like a, a pack of meat, you, <laughs> you can say. Uh, it was very convenient as a pack of meat. Uh, then when we start doing this uh, project, uh, some research was uh, going into uh, design, how to design. And of course, what you, it, it's really going into that direction of uh, the alien baby, isn't it? You know, if you think about uh, the machine or the uh, kind of artificial womb with uh, this transparent uh, that actually got hooked up with all the uh, different tubes and, you know, then of course comes with all the equipment to read. Uh, for us, is uh, the project started with uh, working in this lab and you know, in Paris and situated in the hospital called Hotel Dieu. And so when we start reading it, um, uh, seeing this uh, technology being developed in the beginning, I think uh, the, the pad, uh, the, the kind of transparency uh, electronic part you see here is actually uh, the real object that was being, you know, the real uh, devices that was used to, uh, to take the ultrasound data out of the, the reading. Um, and so of course, at the moment, like for example, we, we can only do the reading of the baby. Of course, in the installation, you, you know, we did this uh, kind of sculpture uh, baby using silicone. We, we tried to experiment also with different material, but it was not able to read. So by like, using silicone is actually quite a practice for the, for the practitioner in the 
in ultrasound to actually have this so-called phantom baby when you do the research. So you have a phantom baby so you can read the data. So in this case, when we actually making the design, we actually, we do have to have a sphere. I, I would prefer, I call it a sphere actually. So I like have this kind of, yes, eggs warm like sphere that had to be filled with water in order for the machine to read. So again, it's a replication of the baby womb is a replication of woman's body. But again, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, I think many, many of the reading materials or many scholars, uh, many of the papers we read, it is really a lot about this visible, invisible is about uh, taking the baby outside the woman's body. So again, we're back to where Chloe, when you first started talking about the power, you know, what's the, what's the power at issue here? You know, maybe we can come back to the power because uh, the issue of power is, uh, do, do the woman have the control of the body? Do the woman who decide that uh, using surrogacy, using, uh, ectogenesis, uh, using different kind of ways to uh, uh, taking, you know, I, I think a lot of baby happening in the womb for his, uh, in, the, in the lab, for example, uh, at the moment, a woman, woman under age 40 are encouraged to uh, save your eggs so that you can continue pursuing your career until uh, when you get older, you cannot work and the eggs still can work for you. Uh, so you can still have your baby, right? So at the same time, I must have to kind of come back to this kind of, uh, uh, kind of behind the scene, what is at play here? You know, are we at the play or certain, uh, political scheme, you know, is this ectogenesis is actually also a, a way, you know, is it, let's put it this way, is it liberation or is it manipulation, right? I leave it here. I think that's a really great point to uh, pass to, along to Amber. It's a really great point to, to get us to, to thinking about speculation is really important, but so is context, right? And if we imagine this technology existing in a perfect utopian world, how we might feel about it is very different to how we feel about um, exogestation or the possibility of it um, in circumstances where, you know, we do have rising maternal mortality. We do have limited access to repro technologies, particularly people from marginalized communities, LGBTQ plus people um, and so on. Um, Amber, I think you wanted to, to speak. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, just to go off on like shoes, like, to, like, sentence about power and whether or not we actually have control. I mean, I think like, absolutely, like, oh, kind of not because like, I, like, society is sort of only interested in, or I mean, that's like a sweeping statement, but society or the state rather seems only interested in like human reproduction because it requires humans as units of labor in order for it to function you know it's yeah, like yeah exactly yeah. like how else is the state going to exist if it doesn't like aid humans in like continuing to like reproduce like is it really aid or is it sort of like a pressure to have a to ha continue your genes um <laughs> yeah i mean like and then also, I guess, like the way in which you sort of perceive motherhood, or if you're if you're a person who's who might become a mother, or yeah, who's who's growing a baby, you know, the the subjective experience is also kind of weaponized because yeah, like you talked about, you know, this idea of natural birth versus unnatural birth. Um, it's a sort of like a distraction for like the state's involvement in like pregnancy uh that's it i think oh carolina we can't hear you one sec you, you muted there we go <laughs> okay i just wanted to add that for some people even uh, c-section is uh unnatural so this is also about definitions of what uh, we think is natural or not and also if it's really important for us to define um, where is the border between natural and natural. 
Um, yes, on that, I love that you just said the word border because there was something I really wanted to come back to that Kristen said. So when Kristen talked about um, the fetus as, as, as like some kind of conquest or the spoils of war, but um, which I loved as an imagery, but um, you also talked a little bit about borders and how this made you think about borders. And I'm really intrigued by this um, in terms of uh, like ectogestation as like a global technology and cross-border reproduction has never been more prolific than it currently is now. You know, people travel the globe for surrogacy um, and reproductive technologies are helping people in Western high-income economies to reproduce in lots of different ways while rising maternal mortality in low-income economies um, I mean, it's rising everywhere, but, you know, we're, we're not helping in, in, in those spaces. Um, it, I, I don't know, it raises some really interesting questions for me. And it still feeds back into design as well, because, you know, if we're using expensive materials to build these machines, then, you know, they're not going to be as accessible in low income economies as they are. Anyway, I'm just ranting now, but um, I'd love to come back to you, Kristen, to hear a bit more about, about what you were thinking when you were talking about borders and whether anybody else has any reflections on on Kristen's point here. I just, I mean, in reading about that, I was thinking about how uh, it it positions the the pregnant person as this um, obstacle. You know that 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 whole idea of getting the pregnant person to consent to having the fetus removed and put in this technological device to further their gestation and how um, that it just suggested a very adversarial relationship between the pregnant person and the medical establishment. Um, and, and that's, I just thought about it historically in terms of how, um, Mm, yeah, historically, how the medical establishment has approached pregnancy, and it's this um, pathology, right, that needs to be fixed or cured or improved on. That there's problems with pregnancy, um, and it and the technology of ectogenesis seemed like oh, we know how to do it better than nature. We can we can propose this technology. We'll solve all these problems. Yet, in fact, it you know the like I talked about earlier the the transparency, the kind of rigidness of the container, that um, idea that they could completely replicate um, the biochemistry just through the oxygenator device and so forth. It, it just seems. Um, very egotistical that 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 we could presume that we could completely replace the 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 body that's designed to um, sustain pregnancy. I'm not sure I answered your question, but those are were, were my thoughts. You know, I just I thought a lot about that conquest. Um. Okay. Just a quick point. It's not just pregnancy, but uh, you know, female reproductive body is always constructed as um, unpredictable, hostile. Uh, you know the history of hysteria. Um, there is, was it nagging uterus or groaning or moaning uterus? It, it, it was considered as a disease, and it is an area that medical professionals not always can control. It is constructed as totally connected to uh, female psychology as well. <laughs> so I can see the interest in controlling it and making it as transparent as possible so that they can control and intervene. And I think, Kristen, you said something about a, a male interest in, did you say that? I Okay, because <laughs> it's difficult to attach it ideas to people. So I remember you mentioned that and I thought, yeah, that's it. That's it. The male control of the uterus would be a big, um, I think, win uh, for patriarchy in that way, if you're thinking about in that in that context. Uh, Holly? Um, just one, one thing that just came to my head, though, is that 
I've like seen the statistic that it's like 300,000 people a year die in childbirth or in pregnancy and childbirth. And um, they're like, when you look at the data on who is dying and how racialized it is, obviously there is like pregnancy is, I like the Sophie Lewis's thing of it being an extreme sport. Like there are bits of it that are dangerous to people and that's stratified. So I guess I don't think the artificial womb or ectogenesis is a solution to it. But I also do think it's important to recognize that it can be shit, <laughs> I think, and like uncomfortable and unpleasant and also dangerous. And that we should be thinking of ways in which to try and alleviate that suffering and pain, whilst also recognizing that for some people it is a joy and and like something that people want to do. Um yeah, but I don't yeah, I don't think ectogenesis is the answer at all. <laughs> at the moment anyway um yeah but even to prematurity as well right if if that's the way in which it's being developed like why are babies prem born prematurely like I, often it's not genetic right it's environmental and um social yeah uh, Kristen I, I'm also noticing that we um aren't talking a lot about the baby you know, and the impact of um, ectogenesis on the baby. Um, so what is missing in this technology that comes from the, the pregnant person, you know, that exchange um, that occurs via the placenta. I, I guess I just think a lot about that. Like, you know, do, do, we, do we really know or think that we can replicate um, and have healthy children through this technology. Julie, did you want to, yeah. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, Kristen, uh, yeah, I was actually at uh, in Paris uh, during your panel discussion uh, about a uh, placenta particularly of your work and uh, the film that you have made uh, with, uh, I think it's called Placenta Underground, is it? Yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, I, I thought that uh, that this particular focus on the study of placenta is also really interesting. Maybe that's the a kind of missing link uh, in terms of like when we talk about etogenesis, it, in, 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 in a way, right? Because if we talk about placenta, it's like, okay, there is that particular relationship uh, between mother and baby uh, when we talk about this particular organ. And then when we talk about uh, the, the outside body uh, experience, so what would be that? Uh, how, how do we cut the umbilical cord in a way also, right? So, uh, Christine, you want to just introduce that particular part a little bit? Um. Um, sorry, I have loud noise going on in my house with my children. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I think that the, the placenta is really, um, an understudied, um, rich resource. It's, there's a lot of unknowns with it as this, um, temporary organ and, um, that kind of exchange between the pregnant person and the fetus that occurs via the placenta and the placenta's role. At this point, there's largely, um, the thinking is all about this conflict, right? That the placenta is the mediator between this, the war between the fetus and the pregnant person. And um, I'm, I remember reading in one of Chloe's article articles about um that that again back to that conflict that pregnancy is a pathology and it, and it it's about this um fight between the fetus and the um and the mother or the pregnant person and how the placenta is really the um negotiator or mediator to ensure um the survival of the placenta really they fate the placenta not survival of the fetus is what i meant to say and I think Allison's keen to jump in. <laughs> um, yes, I was. There's two things that I wanted to to bring up um, to some of the things Kristen has said, um, and I'm wondering they're kind of questions or follow ups or um, provocations. I mean, the first thing 
is, um, and I don't know if this was your position, Kristen, or something that you were kind of also questioning, um, which is like, who are we to think that we can like improve upon nature? Like, I really hope that we can. So like, I like really would, I'm, I'm down with that. Um, I don't. So that's like the first thing I would say, and it's related to this kind of second idea um, of um, when you, when you kind of talk about, and I think some of the readings also problematize this, um, the, as ectogenesis or these artificial wombs as, um, trying to replicate. And I wonder if that's actually what, what, it, what the right way to think about it. Um, right. And I think that some of the, um, readings question this, right. They're like, okay. Uh, we talked about this, I think in our chat, um, maybe Chloe and Carolina one day, like, is the, womb, is the artificial womb, a replacement? Is it a replication? Is it an extension, right? There's all different ways to think about this kind of relation of this space. Um, and I think it might be dangerous or even maybe even wrong to think about it as a as a replication, right? I don't, because that might re replicate all of the things that are wrong wrong with <laughs> the the kind of ways that the, the, the womb um, has been already thought. So I just wanted to, to throw that out there that maybe replication is already producing some of the problems that it's trying to solve. I think replication comes into to lots of the like almost linking back to that like power and control thing as well like if we imagine if we think about the technology as a replication it, it almost is like serving to take away from this power that some people see in pregnancy whereas if we just think about it as something that can um you know also do the same job like much like you know a hoover and a sweep I don't know do you see what I mean like di different thing um Carolina's yeah. raised her hand and she was in that conversation. So um, I'm sure she wants to to add something. Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, it's like uh, walking around this topic. And um, what I found very uh, intriguing was this, uh, this is also related with the topic of power, that um, in these papers which we read, um, there was the um, notion of liberation in that sense that if we will have this technology, uh, we will, this is very femini feministic approach that we will be equal finally on the uh, job market. We will be um, out, I mean, we will reduce the, um, um, I don't know, physical uh, pain, which is related to being pregnant and limitations, which are related with that. And what uh, Christine actually uh, pointed that this is actually maybe quite the opposite. If we are making this um, very technological and then we have these containers which are transparent and we have, um, I don't know, group of scientists working on this technology or even like supporting this process, this is maybe giving this power to to men somehow, maybe this is uh, something like what we are interpreting um, not properly. I mean, there is a risk at least, it's not obvious, but uh, we can also think in that direction that, uh, um, yeah, it can have both sides. Um. I mean, when we were talking about this as well, we, we talked about this as well in terms of the design of the technology too, like, you know it, how important it was that like the male gaze wasn't centered de facto um but then holly raised this also really interesting point that even if you have like an all-female scientist team developing this technology it doesn't necessarily mean <laughs> that like the the device embodies the the kinds of things that we might want it to um because i do think everyone's in agreement <laughs> that this technology could do absolutely amazing things for certain subsets of people or or everyone, depending on the circumstances, but it's about you know all these intricacies about how we make sure that um, it, it doesn't come to detract from other things. On that note, I, I actually thought maybe we could go back to something Holly said um, about stratification and like centering stratification in the conversation about ectogestation because. Um, Lots of the writers who talk about the necessity of this technology um, talk about people dying in childbirth and how painful childbirth is and so on and so forth. And it's it's they there isn't much recognition about how the, the sort of racialized element of it. Like in the UK, um, I think it's um, black women are five times more likely to die in childbirth than 
white women and that is obviously an institutional racism problem right as opposed to a um you know anything innate to um people's physiologies and that raises new questions for me and I, and I can't remember who wrote this but in one of the articles there is a genuine question about if we introduce this alternative you know that's very expensive you know where someone can gestate entirely outside the body and that's something that's predominantly available to richer people you know people who aren't working class for example uh predominantly white people um in that would be the case in the uk etc what does that do then to how we treat problems like maternal mortality um you know do we pay it the same attention and so on so um i was just wondering whether other people had thoughts about stratification and whether that's a worry you have with ectogestation I mean, Holly maybe has something else to say. <laughs> I feel like I've spoken quite a lot. <laughs> I don't have to take up too much more space. But yeah, I think what you've just said is really important. Um, I think the last paragraph of the Julia Cavalier piece that I read um, sort of sums it up. Um, I'm just trying to find maybe there's a bit that's like good to read from it. Um, or, yeah, she she points to the wages for housework campaign. She looks at social reproduction theory and stuff to do with reproductive labor um, as a way of thinking about pregnancy and ectogenesis um, as a way to like defend it as a political provocation um, and thinking about like reconstructing um, what was considered a natural female duty as work. Uh, was a way to claim it's okay actually that that bit doesn't I feel like this isn't going to be helpful me trying to find a bit to read um but yeah I feel like looking at looking at like Marxist feminists and their work on the way in which which care labor is unequally distributed across different kinds of women particularly in a racialized way might be a quite useful way of thinking about stratification and gestation and gestational labor um and so like the one of the examples that Julia Cavalier gives is that uh, say that ectogenesis was used to um, get rid of surrogacy and was an alternative to surrogacy, the women who were doing surrogacy wouldn't suddenly be free to pursue what they wanted to pursue. Likely they'd end up doing other kinds of reproductive work like care work and cleaning, um, which is undervalued and badly paid in society. So I, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm going off on a tangent, but I, 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 fi I find that article useful for thinking about stratification as well as the reproductive justice framework. Um, yeah, I'll let somebody else go. That was great. Thank you. Um, Ilka. Um, all assisted reproduction technologies are widely available to affluent people. So if you don't, I mean, you might have two problems. If you have, a, if you're resourceful, if you have the right funding available and, you know, if you have money and knowledge, um, it might be your country's regulations, which will not allow you to access to certain technologies. Then you can go to less regulated areas like US, for example, um, where reproductive treatment is quite unregulated on purpose. Um, or um, if you don't have enough money, um, you, you cannot even think about these technologies. So you you can't have a baby tough you can't you can't have a baby that's it because you if in the even in the uk in the developed areas of the world um nhs cannot offer uh, treatment for many people and uh, the cycles are so expensive you can't do it if you're a lesbian couple you have another problem you have to have tried like five times before you can go to nhs so you you just cannot um access the treatment uh, on nhs so what i'm trying to say is People, affluent people are the ones who are always benefiting all these kind of technologies. While we are talking about them, we always say that, oh, it, it's going to make it possible for, for couples or people to have babies. But what happens is it's only benefiting a certain group of people in the world. So my feeling about ectogenesis is, although we can see how we can, it can liberate certain populations, it is going to benefit certain kind of people in that population um and that's going to be the always affluent people i think to already existing inequalities um yeah it's a fair point and we'll come to carolina now just to say what that that, that argument and I, and I find it very persuasive it's just true isn't it that you, you you need to be rich to access reproductive technologies 
but it always makes me think of the analogy people introduce about you know the washing machine you know it used to be so expensive it's only for rich people and then eventually it gets so affordable that lots of people have it in their own homes um and that's just somehow hasn't seemed true with reproductive technology and i think that's because of like in a commercial industry people know that people will pay a lot of money for reproductive services and that stops it from sort of becoming cheaper over time um uh, Carolina, did you want to say something? Uh, actually, uh, um, I, I would agree with what uh, you just said, Chloe, about this time which is needed to develop something to make it affordable for more bigger part of society. But it will take, I would say, a lot of time. And at some moment, it will be the um, issue of economical equal in, um, inequality in that sense that uh, someone, one woman is uh, able to afford this method and uh, this is like, I don't know, a better social group uh, because it's, your body is untouched, uh, you are avoiding like some uh, hormonal problems which can appear whatever. And the second thing is maybe a little bit uh, funny, but I, I, I remember I addressed it in our chat that this uh, language again, especially uh, talking about uh, biobags, is making me think about capitalistic use of this technolo technology in the sense that we are having a product and uh, we have a package for this product and we can just uh, sell it to those who can afford it. So. Uh, maybe at some moment as everything else it will be uh, more common and it will be more available but uh, I would predict long long period when it won't so uh, yeah I, I, I see it as a risk to capitalize too much at this kind of solutions definitely um and that that chat actually really stuck with me because we we came from very different places didn't we about bio bags because you know you you said it made me do think of shopping bags and it made me think about all the messaging about like don't let children go near plastic bags for some reason um so we only have a couple of minutes left so um i was really struck by in amber's last reflection she said that sorry they said um they were saying the word exogenesis out loud to um, think about what the connotation was. And I just wondered whether in the last four minutes, maybe each of us could say, and I, I'm actually struggling to think of what I would say myself, but maybe like one word or a phrase or something that you really take away from ectogestation, ectogenesis, now you've spent a month thinking about it. Like what's the thing that you've really, um, come away thinking um maybe amber if if it's not too much to put on you you could start <laughs> it, was, it was a great idea um I, I don't know if i can summarize it into a sentence but i think the thing that i'm taking away of is like care first i think like it's all very good to like talk and discuss and and further this type of technology but i think it's like really paramount that like the spotlight gets turned to this idea of collective care because i think from what history has shown us we can't really rely on like the state or like external factors to provide the care that like human beings need so there has to be sort of more discourse on how we can do it ourselves collectively Great. Um, Carolina, could you? Yeah, I can say just very briefly that I uh, think what, that we are doing a quite good job talking about these things right now. I mean, I am not saying right now in this situation, but uh, that we have this academic discourse and uh, also we have some uh, texts which are more um, experience based because um, this is just happening and uh, it's usually like a law and regulations are very slow comparing to the development of technology. So it's great that we are discussing it when it's uh, just started and we can observe it and we can build a narration which is not always very optimistic. It's very hard, uh, it's very uh, important to, to build also a critical uh, narration around it. Mm. 
Great. Um, should we, everyone online, should we go in the same order we went before? So I'm going to abuse my privilege and go last. Um, but <laughs> um, I think uh, Ilka. I'm thinking of medicalization, I think, um, mostly because I'm thinking ectogenesis is about controlling the medical process of um, something is developing inside the body without our control and uh, our supervision. Um, so I think that's the word control and medicalization. Mm -hmm. uh, Alison? Um, I'm thinking still like the kind of utopic, dystopic, trying to figure out what's happening there. Um, and I would say also the relation between feminism and biology that I think is really, really important that this helps us think through. Uh, great. Holly? Um, I think maybe rather than ectogenesis, is it possible to reconceive of pregnancy in the present, sort of like a communizing of pregnancy, a dissolution or dissolving of the borders of pregnancy? What would that actually look like now? Um, but I do think ectogenesis for me is useful in that it sort of disrupts the category of woman, motherhood and gestation, or like woman and the way in which motherhood, gestation and pregnancy are tied to that. Um, but that you can only abolish boundaries once you have autonomy, I think is maybe where I'm ending on. But yeah, I feel like I've moved further away from ectogenesis than where I began. I'm like, actually, I'm not sure how useful it is right now. How can we reconceive a pregnancy in the present? Kristen. Um, I'm thinking mostly about power relationships and control. Yeah. Cool. I mean, I could say something very profound about well no I probably don't everyone said everything about ectogestation but um I, I guess like for me what I'm really thinking about is how much this needs to not be a conversation that's had like an academic um forums only um like I hope you all feel that this was a really productive way of thinking and, and talking about this technology and for me like thinking about things outside the confines of of the academic uh sort of space and and the way we have to think about things um has been really valuable and i think that the insulation that people like surely are uh, but this insulation but this kind of public facing conversation where we're bringing people together to think about what kind of reproductive futures we want with this as an example for me is um what I'm really taking away from this experience. So thank you very much to Art Laboratory Berlin and to Shuli for building this interface and for allowing us to get to know each other this month. It's been great. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful. Thank you everybody here. We actually do have a few on-site audience uh, persisting. Yeah. Yes, persisting. Anyway, we'll see you next time. We do have two other reading groups coming up, so uh, we'll keep connected. But at the end, I think today we already also talk about surrogacy, particularly I think the topics, the issue is going to be coming back again to us. Yeah. So 